Good evening. Welcome to Gerrymandering 2014. 13. All right. Uh, Thursday in class, we're going to play a little uh, computer simulation called the Gerrymandering Game. Um, but uh, in order to maximize the benefits of that, we want to make sure we uh, know a little bit about it going in. So rather than do these notes, we're going to um, have you uh, watch this at home. All right. So gerrymandering. A couple terms we need to know first before we get into it, because it's kind of used synonymously with these other terms. All right, you need to know what reapportionment means. We covered this earlier in our congressional chapter. Uh, but when we reapportion, we're doing it every 10 years. This can also be called apportionment. Okay, so it's either reapportionment, meaning we do it every 10 years, or apportionment, which is we're just doing it. All right, uh, it's based on the population count that comes from the census, as we know. All right, that started in 1790 and most recent one was done in 2010. Uh, the House of Representatives is the one that decides this. So they make the call on doing reapportionment. And it determines the number of seats a house, uh, a state gets in the House of Representatives. So the more population you have, the more seats you get. All right, uh, the most we have is California with 53, and the fewest is obviously several states with just one. All right. Um, in 1929, that number was frozen at 435 um, just because the number had kept growing and growing. Uh, this is one of those examples of informal amendments to the Constitution I mentioned so often. So for to change it, you would need another congressional law to increase that. Um, but it's basically been frozen since 1929 at 435. Now, don't confuse reapportionment with redistricting, okay? Redistricting, this is also done every 10 years. This is done after we apportion. So when Congress apportions to the states as to how many seats they get, then the state legislature chooses um, what those districts will look like, all right? Um, the state legislature will draw them, the governor has to sign it, and then that becomes the congressional district. So even though they're national congressmen, the districts are drawn by the state. And it determines the size and shape of the district. All right, there are several rules states have to adhere to. Most of those have been defined by the Supreme Court. Um, there are none really defined by law, with the exception of uh, the Voting Rights Act. We'll get into that a little bit later. So reapportionment done by Congress tells you how many you get. Redistricting is done by states, and it determines the size and shape of the districts. All right. Now gerrymandering is when you help your political party gain seats in the House of Representatives, or it could be to help a racial group gain seats in the House of Representatives. But uh, you're basically doing this for political reasons. You're trying to help a group or hurt a group. So it's defined as drawing a district's boundaries to gain an advantage in an election. So that's gerrymandering. So the key is something about an advantage in an election and something about drawing of boundaries. All right. Uh, it is named for Elbridge Gerry, who happened to be uh, somebody at the Constitutional Convention and later a leader of, in Massachusetts, and he drew a district that they said looked like a salamander. I don't know if you can gather that from this picture or not, but uh, this was called the gerrymander, one of the first political cartoons on the subject uh, because Elbridge Gerry <clears throat> made his district look like a salamander, and these are all cities in Massachusetts. All right, there are two types of gerrymandering. All right. One is when we are packing. When a state legislature is packing, they're trying to put as mem many members of one party into one district to limit the amount of seats that they win. All right. So, for example, if I have a community here, all right, and it's predominantly Latino, all right, I might uh, <clears throat> draw my congressional district to look kind of like this. All right. So. Um, I'm going to take this huge Latino community, put some fringe, you know, whites or other minorities on the opposite side and pack them. So the district might have 85 percent Latinos in one district, almost guaranteed that a Latino will be represented um, and leaving this area to be part of a different congressional district where they will probably be the minority. All right. Um, <clears throat> You also do it with political parties too. You'll take a, you'll see this on our districts. In fact, I'll show you a little bit later. Um, but you might do it with a party to try and put as many Republicans in, sort of give that district away, in the attempt to win a few others. And then cracking, is where you split the voters of the opposing party into two different districts. All right. So again, let's say I have an area here. Okay, uh, it's predominantly a Democratic community, like a working class community, like Cicero or somewhere in that in Chicago. All right. I'm going to come in. And I'm going to draw one congressional district here, and I'm going to draw another congressional district out here, 
and I've essentially cracked the Democrats in half. So they're minorities in both districts, and then Republicans would win this one and this one, right? Essentially giving them no representation either. So packing and cracking, all right? Uh, here's Illinois' map from 20, 2000 to 2010, all right? And there's a couple of bad examples here. Um, I was a reader for a gerrymandering question back about 2008. Uh, for the AP exam, and it was sad how many kids in their answers talked about bad gerrymandering and they referenced the great state of Illinois. Okay, uh, this old 17th you see starts all the way up here um, near the uh, Mississippi River and then spans the length of the river down here. Remember, anything in purple is the 17th district. Now it comes down to here, cuts into this little county here, goes this way, all right, here, follows a highway here, and connects this little purple area as well. So it's all one district. Uh, in some places connected by little roads, but it is all one. And um, there's obviously some cracking and packing probably going on in that district um, for the 17th. All right. Uh, another bad one. This is uh, the fourth district of Illinois. <clears throat> We're going to see a video on this in class tomorrow. And this is uh, another example of packing. This is called the earmuff district. If you can kind of make it out, there's one earmuff, another earmuff, and then here's the wrap around that way okay um, <clears throat> this district is represented by a gentleman by the name of <clears throat> Gutierrez so you can probably guess what they were trying to do here you have a large Hispanic community large Hispanic community and you gotta kinda link the two of them because one thing the Supreme Court says is the district have to be touching so they kinda go follow this little line this is literally a road through Chicago goes down in here comes this way and if you look over here this is highway 294 so when you're going uh, to the airport or south from the airport in Chicago here's highway 294 this is the fourth district totally different district here different district here but the road links the two of them and then comes back in and takes this other area Okay, um, this is one of the more egregious uh, examples of gerrymandering. All right, here are the new districts in Illinois, and you'll notice in 2010 they kept the, the earmuff district. It's pretty much intact, almost as is. Part of that's because the population didn't change so much. Okay, so again on the highway here you have the seventh over on this side, and then the fifth over here, um, <clears throat> sort of connecting the two of them. All right, uh, here's our district. We are the tenth. Uh, Brad Schneider's people call our district the uh, the baker with the cake. Okay, you can see the hat here. There's the cake. Uh, here's the cape of the, the baker there. Um, and some of you live in the 14th district over here. So obviously the border is right here in Mundelein. Okay, runs right through town. Actually, I'm sorry. This is the border right in here um, where Mundelein's at. So we're kind of right there in between the 10th and the 14th district. If you live in the 10th, you see it's pretty compact. Goes up in here to Zion in North Chicago, down in here into Winnetka, Wilmette, places like that. And then if you're in the 14th, you have the same congressman here as people down here in Kendall County in central Illinois. Um, so much, uh, much bigger district geographically, but obviously you would know there's less population because uh, it's such a wider area. There's actually the same population, but there's not as, uh, the people are much more spread out, let's put it that way, all right? Um, this district was also challenged in court. They, if you're a Civil War buff, uh, junior, hopefully you still are after America at War, um, this is called the Sherman's March to the Sea District because it begins in Atlanta and goes all the way down here to Savannah and then sort of connects two pockets of the same city there. Uh, Supreme Court ruled this unconstitutional because it wasn't compact. The district covers almost the whole state of Georgia. All right, this is one you'll read about. This is the case of Shaw versus Reno. Uh, this was a district in North Carolina that was connecting Durham right in here through Greensboro down here into Charlotte. All right, these are three urban areas, so you can guess it's poor minority Democrats. And the leg state legislature drawing the district connected all three of them to basically pack all the minorities into one district um, because they were kind of spread out in different areas. Now they were doing this to comply with the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the amendment in 1982 that says you have to give minorities an opportunity to elect the candidate of their choice. All right, uh, This was found unconstitutional because again the district was not compact. I think right here is literally a highway uh, connecting for miles um, the cities. All right. Same thing in this area. You'll see some highways there. All right. So, but also it is touching, so it does comply with one of the standards. And then this is the new gerrymandered district. Doesn't go up as far as Durham, 
and a little bit wider of uh, of areas doesn't fit the roads as much, um, <clears throat> but still kind of links the urban cities together uh, as they were trying to do there. So this was the Shaw versus Reno case. All right, 2002, something interesting happened in Texas. Um, this Texas state legislature um, was uh, Democratic for the most part, even though Bush was from there, if you can believe that one. And uh, when they gerrymandered the districts, you'll see they did a pretty good job of getting Democratic candidates. I believe that it was 17 Democrats and 15 Republicans in this 2002 election. And some Texas uh, politicians were kind of upset by that. A guy by the name of Tom DeLay, he was the head of the, um, was the majority leader of the House of Representatives for the Republicans in 2002. He actually went to jail for this. But what he did is he raised a lot of money to get Republicans elected to the state legislature in Texas. And then in 2004, after they won, uh, in the, or actually in 2002, when they won in the midterm, they decided to redistrict again. All right, the 2000 census was still in place, but they did a whole new redistricting in 2004, and you'll notice they picked up another Republican seat here, another Republican seat here, and all along and by Houston over here, they were picked up some seats as well, okay, um, essentially knocking out this majority that the Democrats had had in place, all right? So you can imagine this case was going to go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court actually sided with the Republicans, saying that there was no law saying they couldn't redistrict. It has custom that you redistrict every 10 years, but there was no law preventing that from happening. All right? And it's got a lot of play because Rick Perry, um, you remember was the mayor of, um, I'm sorry, governor of, of Texas. Um, he signed this into law and pushed for this because it helped his own party. But a lot of the Republicans, Democrats in Texas went to Oklahoma to avoid voting on it so there'd be no quorum in the Texas legislature. But it failed and it, uh, increase the number of House of Reps members for Texas. So here's where redistricting can be very effective um, based on the changes in the legislature. All right, here's uh, our Illinois district again. Uh, this is the 14th, the one I said that encompasses everywhere. You can kind of see Route 83 is where most of this goes along. And it actually makes a turn right by Target and then goes out into Round Lake. All right, so um, so anybody over here, this would be your countryside golf courses into Wakanda. That's the 14th district with Randy Hultgren, who was a Republican who won overwhelmingly in the last election um, for a house by about 80% of the vote somewhere in that neighborhood. And then our district here, um, <clears throat> this used to be Walsh country, but they changed it to, um, they, they basically drew it to get rid of Joe Walsh because what they did is they combined him and Hultgren into the same district. Now that's a common practice too. You'll redistrict to punish a uh, opponent and uh, put two people together, forcing them to run. Walsh decided not to run and he moved down into the eighth district down here um, <clears throat> and ran and lost to Tammy Duckworth. Um, in that regard. But here you can sort of follow the line. It goes all up Route 83, comes in through here into Mundelein, Hawthorne Woods area, and then this is uh, right where the high school is, is where this red dot is, and then it kind of shoots up here to Crossroads into um, on up to Round Lake. All right, <clears throat> so um, so that's the um, how we, we're kind of gerrymandered. Now, if you know anything about Mundelein, while well, we're trying to redistrict, all right, over here, you have all the new houses, new construction, uh, more fluent areas, Hawthorne Woods, places like that, tend to vote more Republican. The older, traditional parts of Mundelein, Diamond Lake, where there tend to be more minorities, tend to vote Democrats. And that's what the Democrats did here, was they sort of redistricted the 10th to get Mark Kirk out by putting more Democratic areas in there. Okay, They actually took Arlington Heights, where Mr. Gorski lives, um, uh, where several voters had voted for Mark Kirk when he was the congressman, and they put that into a Democratic district where they were now the minority and took those Republicans away from the 10th um, and made it more Democratic. Uh, this area up here to North Chicago, Waukegan, Zion, that was not part of the 10th district either. They added that in to increase the number of minorities, and obviously Brad Schneider won, so Illinois gerrymandered very effectively right through your own hometown. All right, here's your court cases to know. All right. Uh, if you have to know one, Baker versus Carr is the one to know. All right? Baker versus Carr, basically, the phrase that's associated with it is one person, one vote. I know I wrote that down here in Westbury versus Sanders, but I'll explain that later. Um, Baker versus Carr, the Supreme Court essentially said that redistricting was something that they could take issue with, that it violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment when you redistrict and you harm minorities. 
Okay, so Baker versus Carr basically said we can take these cases um, and open the door for these and ones underneath it. Okay, so I don't know why, but that's always what the College Board asks about is Baker v. Carr, and they want you to know one person, one vote. But all they really said is that uh, it was a violation of equal protection, and the Supreme Court has jurisdiction over redistricting. Westbury v. Sanders is where the court then ruled, <clears throat> this was, I believe, in Tennessee, that the districts had to have equal population, one person, one vote in each district. You could not have 100 people in one district and 1,000 in another. That was not equal. All districts had to be the same. You would have had to have two districts of 550 apiece. Okay, Reynolds versus Sims was, I put that up for just because it's kind of interesting. It dealt with Alabama, and Alabama um, had used the counties for their state senate. Rather than redistrict every 10 years, each county sent one representative. Well, by the 1960s, all right, Alabama was rural and urban, and the urban had the greater percentage of the population. So obviously they had more people. So the rural districts had less people, but the same amount of representatives. And Alabama argued, well, the US Senate is not based on equal population. Why can't our Senate be? And the Supreme Court actually wrote in their opinion that the US Senate was created by the Great Compromise as a means of political compromise to get the country uh, started and did not set a precedent for other state senates. So essentially it applied the same concept of one person, one vote, um, that you can't use the counties um, for state senate. You have to actually draw districts. All right, in Shaw versus Reno, that was the North Carolina districts I showed you. They said that race cannot be the sole factor. That was the argument in that North Carolina district was <coughs> that it was drawn basically for race. This, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor called it racial apartheid and said race was a um, the main factor, the sole factor. That cannot be it. You can take race as a factor. It cannot be the sole factor when drawing districts. It says the districts have to be contiguous. What that means is that they're touching. All lines of the district have to be touching. So if you have a state that looks like this, you can't have a district like this and call it the same district. They have to be touching um, together. And there's a compactness standard. They don't really measure that, but it means the districts have to be somewhat compact and tightly knit. Doesn't always work because sometimes you have a representative that's down in Kendall County, but um, if within reason, uh, it works. All right. Uh, the Texas case I showed you was the League of United Latin American Citizens. I can see why they're upset against Rick Perry, the governor of Texas. <clears throat> and the court said that you can redistrict. Um, whenever the legislature chooses, you don't have to do it every 10 years. And since race was not the sole factor, it was actually party, okay? Partisanship was okay. Nothing in the Constitution prevents you from redistricting to hurt or harm Republicans. So partisanship was okay, and you can do it um, less than every 10 years. Other limits the Supreme Court has said over time, you cannot dilute minority voting strength, okay? So if you have a minority area, you can't dilute it by cracking or limiting their votes, and communities of interest must be protected. So if you have a community of like-minded people, they should be drawn together in the same district. All right, hope this helps. I haven't looked at the time yet. I'm sure it's longer than it should be. Uh, come to questions with class tomorrow. If you don't, you never know. I might actually have a couple for you as well. Have a great uh, night, and be ready to play the gerrymandering game on Thursday.